I wonder if you could say something about what Chinese criticism, art criticism of calligraphy looks like. Because it would seem to me that if you want to understand from the inside of an artistic practice how works in that practice are evaluated, the concepts used to evaluate them, probably not the best place is to look at theory, um, but probably criticism. So, you know, nowadays we think of an artist having a show and then the newspapers publish criticism, or there's criticism written in cer certain journals. Is there a critical practice around calligraphy and how does it compare to some of the concepts that you're presenting here? In, actually, in Chinese tradition, it's not, um, criticizing is not very well, it's not, um, it's not in use very much. So there is now, uh, in contemporary calligraphy, there are critical calligraphers. Um, I mean calligraphers that criticize others, but uh, it's only related to persons. Because actually, the point is that um, a calligraphy is considered the expression of a person. This is a traditional vision of Chinese calligraphy. Writing expresses the person. So if you criticize a calligraphy, you criticize the person. So that's why you don't have much criticizing. <laughs> calligraphy criticizing and painting is the same problem. Uh, yes, thank you very much. <coughs> For me, it's fascinating because it seems to me that uh, one of the problems we have with Occidental art is a kind of divorce between representation and expression, and it's very hard to focus at the same time our attention on both aspects. So if you are interested in representation, so it's very difficult at the same time to be attentive to, to expression. And it seems to me incredible that in calligraphy you have at the same time both, both aspects. And so you can understand the meaning of the word because it's a written word. And at the same time, and you have the same, exactly the same moment, uh, the same experience of both the meaning of the word and the expression of how it is written. And it seems to me fantastic. Right. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, um, yes, you're right, and thank you, Georges, for that. <laughs> so, uh, so I just wondered about um, the extremely brief, I mean, sort of one-word descriptions that were given of each of the dynasties. I mean, if somebody in the Western art historical tradition tried to do that with... <laughs> some period of Western art history, you'd say, well, look, that's just worthless. I mean, you know, things have to be much more complicated than that. If you look at a period, you see all sorts of differences within them, periods shade into one another. There aren't, you know, precise different. How much were those statements worth? To me, they just sound useless, actually. Well, um, they're not useless to Chinese because, actually, the aesthetic of a period comes when the Chinese divide uh, time in the chronology of history is divided into dynasties. So each dynasty gives a very clear aesthetic style to the dynasty, which is um, which um, carries on propaganda ideology, and this ideology is embodied by the art. So when you say the gene on the momentum, it has a political meaning and it has an aesthetic meaning as well. But it's is it true to the phenomenon that you, I mean, when you look at this... And you mean in Western hi history of art, uh, ten point? No, I mean, if you look at the calligraphy of that dynasty, do you find that degree of uniformity? The point is that, for instance, for uh, Jin Dynasty, it's very difficult to find a number of uh, a great number of this kind of, of works of artworks. But for Tang Dynasty, it does. It works. Tang Dynasty method. You have the method of today. It means that when you study calligraphy, whether it be a regular script on the right or a cursive script on the left, um, you study. You start from Tang Dynasty. And then you study, if you want to study momentum, then you study Qin Dynasty calligraphy. If you want to study 
attitude you study, um, I mean, from the practitioner viewpoint, it has a meaning, it has a sense. Yeah, it, it looks insane for us, but uh, for the Chinese, it does mean something, especially in practice. Pierre, uh, even. You have said that um, calligraphy is an uh, expression uh, at the same time of uh, emotion and uh, disinterestment. And but uh, and and you you have said at the end that uh, criticize the calligraphy is criticize the person. So maybe there is a tension between the disinterested and not in the individuality uh, expressed in the calligraphy and uh, uh, not in the individual emotion, the kind of. Uh, more uh, encompassing or uh, cosmic uh, emotion. And uh, the idea that you can uh, criticize the person and not uh, the artist. Yes, yes, um, yes, you're right. The disinterestment is not, uh, is, uh, was, um, is a term used by Zhu Guangqian, who is an um, early 10th, 20th century uh, theorist, aesthetic theorist. And he, he uses, he, this term comes from Kenshin, from Kant. Mm -hmm. So um, he uses it to explain to Chinese uh, the, the word of disinterest. He gives an, an instance with Chinese poetry and he says, in Chinese poetry you have both the emotional, you have both to, to, to be together with the world and all together you have to be disinterested to feel it. So that's where he uses disinterestment, which you can use also in calligraphy when you appreciate it as a practitioner. That's how he explains it. Now, the, the other question is uh, the tension between the uh, cosmic um, uh, vision of calligraphy, which is explained by the other, another theoretician, which is uh, Li Zhe-ho, and uh, the, 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 ex the explanation he gives to um, the, the the Im imitation, he says there is no mimesis, uh, Aristotelian mimesis in Chinese uh, poetry. He doesn't speak about calligraphy and painting, but this, uh, his theory can be used for it. And he, he says that about um, um, the, um, the relationship between the creation and uh, the, 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 the one who creates. But it's, uh, it's not what... Um, in, in, the understanding of calligraphy, of the history of calligraphy. Calligraphy has, uh, uh, the, the main purpose of calligraphy is to transmit uh, certain norms, which can be emotional, and these norms, of course, are interpreted by a person. So there you can see the character of the person, and you can, uh, in, in the imperial examinations, the, the main exam examination is the writing because you can see if the person is um, straightforward or not. That's what is believed by uh, Chinese um, um, literature. And if he gets the examination, you can, of course, you can see the person. But the norms which are tr transmitted are considered cosmic norms. So you have the person, but you also have the chain of the history. That's why I said it's a shared experience over time and space. Uh, is there in, in Chinese art theory uh, a notion of facture for the painting, for, or for the calligraphy? Well, um, that's what I started with, which is the brushstroke, hua, which means both um, the brushstroke, the stroke, and the painting. It's completely at the beginning. To trace. So this, that's what I started with, which I think is the facture. Le coup de pinceau. Le trait. It's the, the stroke, the brush stroke, the trait, and to paint. Peindre. To trace. Thank you.